Welcome, everybody, to this first webinar. Um, I hope you can all see my screen. If you can't see my screen, then please press the unmute button and tell me so, or use the chat function. But I think everybody should be seeing this now. Okay, I don't hear any complaints, so I'm just going to start, and hopefully everybody can see this. So. Let's talk first about Zoom indeed. Yeah, so Zoom, please, this is the setting what you should have in the left corner of your uh, screen, unmute and start video, which means you've turned them both off, that's good. If you wanna ask a question, you can put it in the chat. There's a little button called chat. If you can't see it, you can click on options and press chat. You can write a question there, or you could also press the um, unmute button and say something but it will take a bit of time until it actually gets through to me. So um, I suggest to write it in the chat first. And as this is my first webinar, you know, bear with me and we're gonna practice this together. Um, one thing that I suggest is that you see this little video window where you should be seeing lots of other people as well, which everybody has their screen turned off. So if you wanna just see me, you wanna be pointing on that, that blue one. I'm gonna just change this here to pointer options. Okay, so this blue thing here, yeah? And then if you don't see me, just go back, click on the other one and press pin this video. That means you're just gonna be seeing me or you can just use the left one and then you won't see anything and you would just see my screen. Essentially, it's just my face. So I'm not adding anything here except for funny fingers. Okay, all right. Now, a couple of words about myself. So I saw that there are at least 20 people or so that don't know me. So a couple of words about myself. My name is Simon Lorenz. I'm uh, born in Germany, but I've lived uh, half of my life elsewhere. I live now in Hong Kong for the last 12 years. I pretty much like everything about scuba diving. I'm a scuba diver, a tech diver. I've done trimakes. I like free diving. Um, essentially, the last five years, I've been an, a photographer, underwater photographer. I've been writing for magazines and I've been presenting at dive shows, so generally I like to spread the love, uh, as I'm doing now digitally. Um, also, six years ago, I became a PADI instructor, and over the last few years, I've developed myself to be a photo coach, so there is no college in the world where you can go, so it's all sort of developed by my own experience, and that's essentially what I'm sharing with you today. Also want to quickly mention the brands that are supporting me. So Isotta, for example, is giving me housing, so it's super useful. And um, I'm also working with Hollis, Bear, Atomic, a couple other brands who support me with material which makes my uh, uh, work life so much easier. Um, this is Insider Divers. Essentially, we do scuba diving group trips. This is a company I started four years ago. Um, we basically organize trips anywhere in the aquatic world and they're all group trips, so we uh, don't do individual trips. They're always groups, five to 10 people. Uh, there's always somebody who travels with the group, expert of some sort or level, like myself, instructor or photographer. We might have a tech uh, uh, instructor to join if it's a tech trip. We try to make specialized itineraries, so special trips that are put together to be special and interesting, and we always have this aspect of education and coaching in there, so we always want to continue continue developing ourselves and we want to uh, help people get better in their diving, the photography, learn more about the animals. And so this is part of all of our trips. Um, what are our trips? They might be expeditions. They can be safaris. We do both hotel-based, so land-based or liveaboard type uh, uh, trips. Uh, we have specific things like photography workshops. We also have uh, rec trips. Uh, we do trips that are for tech. So we have something for everybody. Um, and so, yeah, if you just uh, have a look at our page, if you don't know us yet, you uh, will be able to see what we have on offer. So never stop learning is the thing that I like to put myself as a measure, and that's what I do throughout the trips. So whenever we uh, touch a new topic, I research it and share it with everybody. Um, oh, here's a nice animated map of all the places that we are going to or planning to go to. So pretty much you can see all over the world. Okay, let's talk about Lightroom. Right, we're now at 35 people, fabulous. So Lightroom is the program that essentially with a couple of clicks lets you make a great photo out of an average photo, an average photo. You can see what I've done here is suddenly added color, contrast, sharpness, and suddenly you get a nice saturated picture. That's all done in less than a minute in Lightroom. 
Here you can see a photograph that's taken with natural light and the sun is at an unfortunate angle. You can see how the turtle's face is really dark. Even that is no problem. We can bring back a lot of those details just using Lightroom. We don't need Photoshop anymore. We can do this all with Lightroom. Macro as well. If you've done macro photos, you will know that often your photos are maybe slightly flat or there's some bothering things in there. With Lightroom, you can edit that out and make a really nice subject background separation. Also, when you've taken a photograph like this from my last trip, you can see here the bottom is really underexposed. That's because we're at 35 meters and uh, I didn't want to overexpose the fish. No problem, because in Lightroom you can bring that all back. So you can see now the bottom of the boat now has details and color and all the fish are also in the nice color that we want them to be. You can also do what I call a complete recovery. Here's a shot where obviously one of my strobes wasn't quite firing. No problem, as long as you shoot in RAW and you use Lightroom, you can bring all these photos back to actually make it a very presentable photograph. So this is also all done in Lightroom, no Photoshop necessary. Let me bust a myth here for you as well. When people start with uh, underwater photography, they often are surprised how often and how intensively we use editing software. Let me tell you, any photo that you've any, ever seen anywhere in any magazine, on any website, anywhere, has very likely been edited. I would say 99% sure it has been edited. And this is true even for the time before we got digital photography. Here's a famous photograph, James Dean in Times Square. And on the left, you see what the darkroom editor did in terms of editing. Because back in the day, even though we had film, people always believe it came perfect out of the camera. That's not actually the case. It comes out in a certain way, and in a darkroom, the editor would essentially burn and dodge the picture with different tools to make certain areas brighter or darker. And so that would happen in a dark room, and I think that is why uh, Adobe called this Lightroom, because you can do this work at daylight. Yeah, so we can do this, we don't have to have a dark room. Yeah, <clears throat> Adobe uh, launched this product as officially called Adobe Photoshop Lightroom. So if you look in the product description, it actually is called Adobe Photoshop Lightroom. That is because it's actually a side program to Photoshop. Photoshop, you must have heard of before because it's been really the industry standard since the 90s, um, was the first program that came out and really successfully was there for digital editing. And then with digital photography becoming available to everybody, suddenly you needed programs to manage uh, uh, your, your photos before you could bring them into Photoshop. So Adobe had several products um, and essentially they took over a company and launched with that Lightroom and that turned out to be the most successful photo editing software for underwater. So in my experience, most photographers will be using Photoshop or Lightroom or actually only Lightroom in the underwater world. Therefore, it's no surprise if you noticed this in the last three months, actually a photo of um, Tobias Friedrich, who's one of Germany's big photographers, uh, was actually part of the opening screen of Lightroom. You can see this above, beautiful above and below photo from Oman. That is because any above and below photograph will need some touch up in Lightroom. And as I'll show you in uh, the third part of this webinar series, um, essentially it's very easy to do. Yeah. So, um, Photoshop Lightroom Classic and Photoshop Lightroom are not for free. Um, as you know, uh, very little things are for free. Um, we, we essentially have to pay $10 per month in order to get this amazing pro uh, program, but that's not very much. If you look at the range of all of Adobe's products, even Adobe Reader, which essentially just gives you PDF, costs $20 a month. So Lightroom and Photoshop, and actually Lightroom comes in two programs, you get it together for sort of like a mini price, which they call the photography package, and that costs only $9.99. And so you're actually getting three programs, or at least two programs, for the price of a half. So it's a really good price. I know it adds up to $120, but it's the only way you can make use of it unless you wanna go pirating, which I don't suggest. So you need to spend $9.99 per month, but that means also you're gonna get all the updates and improvements to the software. And I can tell you in the last few years, there's been many improvements. So it's worth being on this plan. So Lightroom actually combines a lot of the things that you had in Photoshop and then 
uh, there was Camera Raw, which was a program that imported photos into Photoshop, as well as Bridge, which was a man or is still is a managing software. Lightroom essentially is the best of all three in one program. It's really easy to manage your photo volume. What that means, you'll see later, but essentially it's extremely easy to uh, manage how many photos you're going to keep and how many photos you're going to delete and which photos are your best. One thing that's really great about it, it is it's basically single level editing. It's very simple. You can see what you're doing. All is in one control sheet and you can edit your photos very, very easily. And you can learn basically by yourself what style you like and what you want to do with your photos. It's very simple editing and it's non-destructive. Non-destructive means that it doesn't change the original file. So your original photo never changes. All that changes are the fine tweaks that you're doing to it, but essentially you're not destroying the original photo. And that's great because that means you can keep your edits separate from your original photo and it will allow you to make many different variations of the same photo. What it also is really good in is if you found the setting for a certain photo that you like, you can use that on all of your other photos of the same day, of the same dive site, or even all of your photos. So you, with simple copy and paste, you can do batch editing, which makes your life so much easier. And finally, it's easy transferable with a little trick that I'll show you in a little bit. But essentially, with that trick, you're going to able to very easily transfer your photos from uh, from one computer to another or from one computer to somebody else's computer. I also need to clarify this confusion. I don't know if you've noticed this when you download Lightroom, actually what you get is Lightroom CC, which is what you see on the left, which is this slightly more turquoise color uh, logo. And what you want and what this uh, workshop is about is Lightroom Classic CC, which is on the right. Um, they're both part of Adobe Creative Cloud, and cloud is the, the main word that's a difference here. Basically, Lightroom CC on the left is designed to be working with photos off the cloud. So when you sign up, you actually get 20 gigabytes for free, and you load your photos into the cloud. And the advantage is whenever you pull up your phone and you want to continue editing, you will have access to the same photos. The second thing is that it's designed for touchscreen interface. And the Lightroom Classic, the one that we're using, is designed for desktop and not the cloud. So the two reasons are there quite obviously. We don't want to upload all of our underwater photos into the cloud because we first want to get rid of the bad ones. And essentially, if you've been taking photos for a little bit, you will notice that 20 gigabytes is very, very little for your amount of photography. So that's why the vast majority of people that I know are using Lightroom Classic because you can use uh, your hard disks or your external hard disks as your storage for your photos. And you've got the huge uh, uh, possibilities of doing all of your controls in one overview because you're using your mouse. There is actually the option of using uh, Lightroom Classic with a touchscreen Windows PC, but you will see immediately that that is not working. The controls are too small. And therefore then, if you want to use it on your tablet, touchscreen uh, computer or phone, you should be using Lightroom CC. So today we're talking about Classic. If you haven't installed it yet, do it after this session so that you can make use of everything that I'm doing. A second thing that I would like to say is that you should always shoot in RAW. Now, most cameras these days are able to shoot in RAW. Even the smaller uh, um, cameras such as the Olympus Tough is now since the 5 or the 6, uh, now also has RAW. And RAW essentially allows you to do more things with your photos, particularly when you're using Lightroom. I like to compare it like this. JPEG is a final product. For example, a loaf of bread. And raw is the ingredients for your bread. So imagine it like this. You take a photo underwater, or in this case, you want to bake a bread, and the camera immediately gives you a JPEG. Essentially, it gives you a final product. It decides how that picture will look. And that is not what you want. What you want is you want to have a choice of options. With the same ingredients, you can make various different kinds of breads, as well as with the same raw file, you can make various different kinds of photos, very dark photos, very bright photos, black and white, sepia, oversaturated, Instagram format, uh, Facebook, selfie square, etc. All of these things you want to do, and that is better if you start from the ingredient level. That's why you want to shoot in raw. Another huge advantage is if you're planning on brightening or darkening your photo, which happens very often. Underwater, it is so often that we're either overexposed or underexposed. If you're shooting in RAW, 
you have a lot more flexibility in terms of lighting. Here is a photograph that I took in South Africa a few years ago, and this was in JPEG only. And if you reduce the brightness just by a little bit, look what happens. I'm gonna magnify this here. You can see here, I hope everybody can see this in my magnification. It might be on some screens a bit small. You can see these rings. And these rings are what we call artifacts, JPEG artifacts. That is because this information, the, the brightness information is not retained in the file anymore. So if you're shooting in JPEG, you're gonna get a lot of artifacts. So that's why I wanna be editing in RAW, which allows you to do much more brightness control without losing any quality. The other thing that it gives you, it gives you a lot more color control. So you can control each pixel individually rather than the entire picture in one go. Here's an example of an underexposed photo. You can see the bottom is very, very dark, and it looks like there's almost no picture information left. But if I edit this based on my raw file, I can, with partial edit, bring back all this color. As you can see now, we still got yellow down there. All the fish are yellow. But if you look on the right, on that uh, prop shaft, you can see that there's actually all the colors that, if I go back to the uh, original raw file, are all dark. Now imagine you had the same picture in a JPEG and you would use the exact same edits. Well, what you would get is extremely messed up colors. So not only would the blue start getting purple, but also you can see these fish are not actually turning yellow. And finally, we're losing also a lot of detail. A lot of the detail gets lost because we're starting off a JPEG. So therefore guys, please, uh, if you haven't done so so far, please turn to RAW and don't shoot JPEG anymore. If you sort of wanna get used to it, you can in all cameras choose to shoot JPEG and RAW for the time being and then change over later. So what are we gonna to do today? Um, today we're gonna to go through several parts. We're gonna go through a general workflow. Uh, I'm gonna give you an orientation of the program. Um, and these two things really are for people who've never used it. So if you've used Lightroom before, this will be a repetition and I apologize, but you will see in the next part uh, next week, Monday, that will be uh, a, a lot more interesting for if, if you used it before. But I do want to start for everybody from scratch. So we're going to talk about workflow and orientation. I'm also going to give you one tip about settings. That's also where uh, more experienced people should, should please listen up because this is going to make your life a lot easier. Uh, I'm going to talk about how to import photos, how to rate them, how to delete. And just at the end, I'm going to give you a quick uh, uh, peek on what we're gonna be doing next week, so the kind of edits that you can expect to learn next week, and how to export, because I expect that if you're starting to play with it this week, you might already wanna produce some JPEGs, so I'm gonna show you today how to uh, export from the program. So the workflow traditionally always was, start with Lightroom, this is where you import your photos, and then go to Photoshop, if you're using Photoshop, and then go back to Lightroom. So in Lightroom, you would organize your photos and you would do a lot of things, white balancing, lighting, slight crop, light scatter, so small little particles you take care of. You would definitely do all your color tuning in Lightroom and you would do some other editing. And then if you wanted to, you would bring it all into Photoshop where you would do bigger things like heavy scatter, think scatter that is uh, dominant, object removal if you want to try to get rid of things, um, and particularly sharpening and partial editing you would do in Photoshop. However, Lightroom has now become so good that essentially you can skip Photoshop altogether and you can do it all in Lightroom. Because in the last two years, uh, definitely in the last two, yeah, two to three years, Photoshop uh, features have been entering into Lightroom in such a fashion that you can actually skip it most of the time. That's why we're gonna be doing four sessions on Lightroom and Photoshop will be an optional after that. But in most cases, you don't need it. So that's why this is how I'm organizing these webinars. Today, we're gonna to talk about Lightroom itself and show you how to organize photos and then export. Um, in the second part, which is next week, Monday, same time, is gonna be all the real editing, the single editing, which is basically single level, everything that we do in terms of color changes, as well as some detail editing. In part three, we're only gonna focus on partial editing because this is where we start putting layers in. This is where we're importing some of the logic from Photoshop, but in a very simple way. And that's where we're gonna spend all of part three on partial editing, so your gradients and uh, things like that. And 
there's going to be a part four where I'm going to talk about some really uh, sort of fine-tuned things such as uh, transform distortion and defringe. But also by then, I think I might have collected wishes from all of you of things that you would like covered. Um, and we will also cover those in part four. All right, so let's switch to the program. Um, so I'm going to turn over to Lightroom. And here, here it is. Here's Lightroom. I'm going to just um, activate this little tool here. I'm going to essentially talk about four parts of this program. First, I'm going to talk about this top bar here on the right. Then we're going to be talking about this right side. We're talking about this left side. And we're going to talk about this bottom side. Now, before I go into the detail, let me tell you that if you're ever getting stuck with Lightroom, if you're ever having the feeling it's not working, I don't know why it's not working, make sure you've checked all four areas because in one of them very likely is the answer of why it's not working. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with the first one, which is this top here. Um, and let me just see if this works. I have this magnification here. I hope this works for everybody. But in the top here, you see library, develop, map, book, etc. Let me tell you, you're only going to need two. That is library and develop. Library is where you manage your photos, where you import your photos, where you might delete some of your photos, and develop is where you do all the edits. So today, we'll be spending all of our time in library. Now, one thing that might happen is that it disappears. So up here in the top, you see this little pyramid. And when this pyramid is pointing to the outside, that means that bar is solid. But watch what happens when I click onto it. Oops. Oh, one moment. So when I press onto this, it becomes a different triangle. It's now dotted and it points towards the inside of the picture. This means you've now activated the hover function, and that means it will disappear. You see, when I go over it, it will appear, and when I go away, it will disappear. My suggestion, if you're new to uh, Lightroom, is that you start with having them all activated permanently, because very often you'll be like, why is it not working? And that's because that bar has just disappeared and you can't see what you're doing. OK, let's look here on the left. On the left, you can see all my photo folders. And these are my different servers that I'm using in disks. If you're into photography, after a while, you will see that your computer hard disk won't be enough. You add a hard disk and a second hard disk and then maybe a NAS. And all of these are essentially my photos over the years. So you don't have to worry about this. But this is essentially where your orientation is. This is where you move between your different folders. And then this is also where your import button is. So down here in the bottom, you have your import. We'll come to that in a little bit. Then in the bottom, you see all of your folders of this folder. So let me just go to the um, folder that's selected here. This folder is Raja Ampat that's selected. And then whatever, a certain day. And down here in the bottom are the individual photos that you're looking at. So when you go through these, you're actually selecting each individual photo. You can, in library view, view them one photo at a time, or you can see them in a grid. The grid is quite useful when you want to compare. You can also change your thumbnails, bottom right corner. So you can change the size of that. And on the left, corner, you basically pick which view you want. We're not going to go to the x, y view, which I'm going to cover next week. Um, but these two views are the ones that we have. So this is the single view. Then we also have down here a filter. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And this filter allows you to fine tune what you're looking at. We'll get to that. And then we have the right side. Today, we can ignore the right side. So I'm just going to skip over this right side part. That's going to be much more relevant when we're in develop mode. But essentially, you can already see in here is where you've got all your um, uh, you know, details, in this case, of the photo. Um, 
any presets you've been using, names, uh, ratings, uh, your dimensions. If you go in detail, it even has your lens, which camera you used, et cetera, et cetera. That's all visible here. So that's the metadata of your photo. Okay, so that is your general orientation. Let's come to the settings. And there are several settings that was going to be important, but I'm going to mention them when we get to them in the next webinars. So in the one setting that you need to change, and everybody should change this right away, is essentially how you interact with all the photos. Lightroom wants you to save everything in a catalog, and it will also save anything in a catalog. And I find that often people find the catalog confusing. The other problem with the catalog is it is specific to a hard disk. So you have a catalog on one computer. If you're on a different computer, you have a different catalog. The catalog is basically lists down everything you've ever done to any of your photos on this particular computer. Now, I find it much easier to just ignore the catalog and go for XMP. XMP is essentially the information that what you've done to a picture in a little picture file. Let me show you what that looks like. We're going to be uh, changing this in a moment, but essentially when you get Lightroom, this tick automatically right changes it to XMP is disabled. That means that everything is only saved in your catalog. And if you change computers, that information is gone. So if you tick this, which I'm going to show you in a second how to do, what's going to happen is next to your folders, you see here on the left, that's my Nikon RAW file, 0482. NEF, that's Nikon Exchange Format, that's my raw file. And next to it, after I've edited this photo, is an XMP file. And the XMP file is literally only 10 kilobytes. That's like the weight of a hair in digital terms. And that includes all the settings that I've applied to it. Uh, what I've done with my blues, my sharpens, which objects have removed, all of that information gets automatically saved into this file. And this huge advantage of that is, is this file you can move to any other computer and all of your settings that you've applied to a certain image are there and you can continue playing with them. So that's why we tick XMP. And that is for today, the only setting that I'm going to uh, want to show you. Um, so it will be my handout. So don't try to do it now. I'm going to send you a handout probably tomorrow morning, my time. And there you can see how to do this. But for those who know their way around, you go in the top left, you click on Lightroom Classic. It's a bit different on Windows. I'll say that in a second. You go to Catalog Settings. And then you tick this one, which is called Automatically Write Changes in XMP. And you can already see, warning, changes made in Lightroom will not automatically be visible in other applications unless written into XMP. So they're already warning you that if you don't tick XMP, you might not be able to see your settings. But for some reason, Lightroom gets installed on your computer without XMP enabled, which I think is a big flaw. So make sure you tick this. And if you have already used Lightroom before, but you've never ticked it, you will see that your computer is going to work on this for a while. Because essentially, it will go through all of your files and attach these little XMP files. And so let it do that overnight. And then you will have all the XMP files in your folders the next day. If you are using a Windows, uh, computer, um, it is under edit. So you need to go into edit and then in the bottom there's catalog settings and then you go into editing and then you find this XMP. If you don't find it, send me a message and I will show you how to do it. All right, now we're going to go to import. That is how you bring your photos into Lightroom. Before that, the question often is how do you organize your photos on your computer? And if you have a Mac, also with certain Windows PCs, you will know that once you insert your memory card into the computer, every program is trying to somehow decide for you where you're going to put it. My suggestion is to always deny that and do it yourself. I want to know where my photos are. I don't want them to be hidden somewhere in iPhotos or somewhere in some subfolder in the Windows. I want them to be easily accessible. So I suggest that either in your desktop or in your personal documents, you create a photo folder and you put all of your photos into this folder. And you can see here already the logic how I make my photo folders. So every import, so every trip essentially, is uh, sorted. 
So if you change the name of that folder to the year and the month, then it will automatically sort. If you sort it by name, it will automatically sort them and it makes it very easy for you to find your photos. So my suggestion is that you do that um, for all of your existing folders so that you have them all in one place and then you can import the whole thing into Lightroom. Um, there's an additional level that you can do that is up to you. I sometimes do it when it's a trip when there's a lot of things. So here you can see my Sri Lanka folder from the last trip. You can see down here, 2020 March Sri Lanka. And then in there, you see these folders. So these were the folders we took in Colombo. Chef will know some of these. Yeah, so we've got here Lotus and Colrec on day one, Car Wreck on day two, etc. You can do sub-sorting like that if you want, but you don't have to. Then Afa gave me some of her photos to edit, and then Melissa gave me some of those photos. And then these are the photos from Trinko Mali, and, and so on. So you can sort them like this and uh, find them back in Lightroom if you like. But I don't change the names of my files. So I just copy them from, the dit, from my SD card and copy them into a folder like this. Now I know exactly where my photos are, and I don't have to ask any program where they are. Oh. Now that you've done that, let me show you how to do that in how to bring that into uh, Lightroom. So we're here in Lightroom and we're going to import a test folder. So in my uh, desktop that I've created for this, I've got a photo folder and I made one thing called test trip. And in here you will see I've made four fake essentially uh, days, day one, day two, day three, day four. Let's say today is the first day and we're only importing day one. So I would click on this and it will automatically show me the photos that are new in here. So because it's my first import, they will all be new. And now one thing is important that you, if you've played around with it before, is that you make sure that here in the top, it is add and not the other ones. Because the other ones actually create duplicates that you don't need. So make sure it says add on the top right. And the other one that's important is that you say new photos, but that is automatically like that. So if you've got Lightroom new, new photos will be activated. And you can see they're already ticked. So all of these photos from these days are already ticked. And then here on the right side, there are some things that you can do to import. My suggestion is to just look at my handout because as you can see, I don't do any of that. None of this is necessary. The one thing that's kind of funny that you can do is add keywords. So you could say, okay, this is the uh, Raja Ampad trip, for example. So you could write Raja Ampad in there. Um, you could say uh, coral, yeah? So all of these, coral reef was a keyword I used before. So all of these pictures will now have these keywords written into their metadata. But I don't even do that most of the time. I just import all of this. Bottom right, you see there is an import button. And with this import button, we now are going to import these photos into Lightroom. What does it mean import? They're not being moved because we've uh, selected add. We're not, actually, um, we're not actually moving anything. What we're doing is we're bringing them into Lightroom. We're looking at them with Lightroom. So now you can see the photos are in here. There are some ways how you can uh, change what you're looking at, like different folders, Etc. But these are the ones that I've just brought here. Now, if I want to add more photos, I can always go again, import, bottom left. And for example, add day two, right? But an easier way I'm going to show you now is once you've already installed something, what you can do is you can go onto the top folder in this case, it's the folder that we started with, which is called 2020-03 test trip. And right click on it and press synchronize folder. What this will do is we'll check inside this folder if there are any new photos. And it says, oh, I found 30 photos. So if you now press synchronize, it will actually give you another step where you can decide if you want to add all of these photos. If you look at the top left, you can see now all these four folders are now included. So I say, yes, please import these as well. 
And you can see here on the left that they're now slowly being imported and all the different days are being put here. Why am I showing you this synchronized option? Because if you've used Lightroom before, I invite you to just synchronize a whole segment. So if you have this structure already there, just right click onto the folder, press synchronize, and then synchronize, uh, basically bring in all the folders from that folder. And the structure that you have in Windows Explorer or in the folder view in, in Finder is going to be exactly the same. So that was our import. Let's go towards rating. And rating is extremely useful trying to decide on which ones are actually the best photos, which photos you want to edit, and which photos you want to get rid of. And also, this is the place where you can delete your photos. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the problem that once you've got all your photos on your Windows Explorer or your Finder, it's real pain to delete them. And you end up having and keeping all these photos because you're not sure should I delete or not. This is a great thing about Lightroom. I'm going to show you how you can get rid of those photos easily. First, I want you to decide which photos to edit. And I'm going to start now introducing uh, shortcuts. So uh, keys on your keyboard that you can press to do certain things faster. Today, it will only be rating. So if you want to rate your picture as a photo that you want to edit, a photo that you want to put on Facebook later or send to your friends, that should be a five. And what's a still a good photo is a four. This is the logic that I apply, and you'll see in a second how it works. If you have a crappy photo, but it's something that you, is worth keeping, for example, a manta ray belly shot that is not pretty, but it still says something about this particular manta ray, or sometimes when a shark passes by, I just do a sneaky scrap, uh, a scrap shot, so I'm just quickly taking a photograph of the genitals so that we can say later, oh yeah, this is a female, this is a male, uh, or a young male, etc. So that's not a pretty photo because I basically put my camera under the skirt of the shark, but it is useful to keep just so that you have the information. So those photos I rate three. I'm not gonna edit them, but I'm gonna keep them. Um, if I mark my picture with two, that's just my personal way of doing it. If I really mess something up, like something I should have known, better, like too slow shutter speed or too wide aperture or something wrong with the strobes or whatever, I mark them with two because it allows me to look at all of my twos in my entire catalog and remind me what things I did wrong. If you're not happy with your rating, you can also click zero and just unrate. There's another way you can label them. So that allows you to do a bit more sorting. I'll show you in detail how that works, but essentially six, seven, eight, and nine, these numbers on your keyboard give you additional colors. And this is what it looks like then. Once you've rated them all, you can essentially look at them and you can fine tune your rating. You can look at all of your five stars. I'm gonna show you in detail how that works in a moment, because down there in your filter, you can essentially make with this equals or larger than, you can look at all of your five stars or four and five stars or three stars. You can look at them all separately. And you can cross label them with colors to do even more differentiation. I'll show you how it works in a moment. Maybe it's a bit confusing if you've seen it for the first time. What we can also do is we can mark the pictures that we want to delete. The good thing here is you're not deleting them yet. You're just flagging them as rejected, which means you're marking and saying, I think I'm going to delete you. But the good news is before you actually delete them, you can have another look and make sure you're deleting the right ones. Uh, very often you go very quick, you know, you have a whole series of crappy photos and you just go X, 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 and you basically keep on deleting all of your photos. And then suddenly you're like, oh, marked one that actually is pretty good. Then you press U and that basically takes that flag away. Later when you're ready, very often I only do it at the end of the trip. You go into this segment, which I'll show you in a second where that is on the program, and you press delete rejected photos. The program will give you these two options and it will suggest remove. Again, huge mistake in this program. Remove means it's just going to take it out of your catalog. And all these photos that you've already decided are crap are actually staying on your hard disk, polluting your hard disk with a lot of space. So make sure when you do that is you press delete from disk. That is very important. Otherwise, well, you're probably going to do it once and then curse yourself. 
OK, let's go into Lightroom. Let me show you how it's done. So I'm just going to go here to day one. You can see on the left, that's where I select the photos of just this one day. I could also, I'm going to turn on this feature that allows you to see which buttons I'm pressing. If you press Shift and day two as well, now you can see I've marked two days. If you look in the bottom, you can now see I've got two days that I'm looking at. So you can choose any of those days and just edit those days. So we're going to play on these days today. If you double click on the image, it will fill the screen. You can also press this top here to fit. That also will make it fit to the screen. And before we do any edits, we're just going to go look through them. This looks pretty good. You know, you see the reflection pretty nice. OK, I'm going to make this a five star. Oh, that's also nice. I'm also going to give this a five star. Oh, but this one is much better. The subject is much closer, also a five star. And the next one is even better, also a five star. Now you can already see, sometimes the first photo seems really good, but now compared to the next photo that you see, it's not as good anymore. Now what you can do is you can just go back with right and left and say, okay, well, you are not a five star anymore. You are now a four star. Another way of doing it, so let me just add a couple more to that. Make this a four star, four star, or make this a five star maybe. Now we come to the filter. So here on the bottom, you've got the filter. When you get your program, it actually is put together. So what you need to do is you need to click on filter so that these options will open up. OK? So you press on filter and all these options appear. So here is these, this star uh, rating uh, sort mechanism that I showed you earlier. It already has the equal and greater than. And if in here you now click five star, then it will show you all the photos that are five star. But now you can already see clearly, well, this one and this one, they're both not as good as that one. So what I can do is I just press four, and you will see they will disappear out of this selection. So I've now narrowed it down to these three. OK, I think this one is also not worth adding, so I'm getting down to these two. And then these two are the ones that you can focus on. If you also want to apply colors, let me just show you. If you press Shift, you mark all of these pictures. right? So let's just say you don't only want to use rating, but you want to pick one photo a day that you want to export for your sponsor or your mother or who knows. So you just press 6 for red. I always use red for Hollis, the stuff that I sent to Hollis. Yeah. Let's say these ones. Now I can sort all of my five stars. But I can do an extra sorting, which is my red five stars. So you can see you essentially get more filtering options. Obviously, with such a small amount of photos, not very useful. But once you get more photos, it is going to be very helpful for you. OK. So when you untick this, you see in the bottom right here, when I click on this again, it will take off this selection. If I click again on five star, it will bring all of my photos back. So this is the sorting. Now let's come to the delete. So this photo, for example, you can see there's a horrible reflection in there. I'm going to mark this as delete. So you press X on your keyboard, or right mouse click, go to set flag, press reject it. So much work. So just remember to press X. Now this one, look at this. Coral bombies look horrible. X. Next one, X, and so on. Here's some photos. They're super dark. I'm just going to mark them X as well. And now you can see in my different folders, I've got various that are now marked as X, rejected. And if you look in detail, you can see they're faded out. But these photos are still here. They are just marked for deletion. That means you can decide later if you want to delete them or not. So I advise that you click on this folder down here, sorry, filter down here. Arno, I'll come to you in a second. Thanks for the question. So here you've got the filters. And if you click the one on the right, 
he will show you only the ones which are flagged for deletion. So here on the left, can everybody see that? On the left, you now have only the ones flagged for deletion. And you can now click through them and just go through those. Yep, OK, I want to delete them. So Arnaud just asked me here on the uh, chat if these controls are the same on Windows. Yes, they are. The filter one is just uh, reduced in your original um, in your original setup when you start with it. So on I think Windows you do have to once click on uh, some of these like flagged and rated. You have to click on them once and that will activate them, and then they will stay here forever. Now you've got these photos. I don't actually have to keep them like that. I'm in agreement, I want to get rid of them. So I'm going to click on photo, delete rejected photos. OK, so this is also the same in Windows. Delete rejected photos now will delete all these photographs. And here comes the question. Make sure you don't tick remove, which is what they're suggesting that you do, because that will only put it out of the catalog. You still have those photos on your hard disk. Make sure you press delete from disk. And this will actually move them to your uh, garbage can. So the good news is, even if that, if you've done all these clicks by mistake, essentially you can still reactivate them from your garbage can. Yeah. But as you can see here, is if you go through uh, your entire folders throughout an entire trip, x x x x x. I often delete 50, 60 percent of all of my photos. We've got digital photography. Better take 10 times as many photos if you got the opportunity to and delete later that and then you just have to get rid of them currently my camera each file is 50 megabytes so every trip i might add 200 gigabytes to my hard disks so i have to make use of this feature so i recommend you use this feature um, to reduce the file load okay now before i come to export i want to tell you that these are the things that i would practice my suggestion would be tomorrow morning, I'm going to send you the handout, and I'm also going to upload the video of this presentation, that you go through this on your computer in the next two or three days. And try to structure your photos on your uh, Explorer or Finder in a way that is easy to import them into Lightroom. Then import them into Lightroom and start rating a couple of your underwater photos. Just play around with the four or five stars. People have different ways of doing it four or five stars, like I'm using it, it's just my way, people might do it differently. And make sure that for next week when we edit photos, you have at least four, preferably more, five-star rated pictures, or pictures you definitely want to edit. Yeah? Also practice deleting photos and send me questions. Okay, Send me questions uh, on WhatsApp, uh, on email, on Messenger. I mean, you're all connected with me somehow. Make sure you connect with me and just ask me those questions. Please don't ask them all on Sunday night, the day before we, uh, or the night, or just a few hours before we have the next session. I want to take the time to help you with it. So it would be great if you can just play with it in the next few days and send me all your questions. So before we come to uh, open questions, I want to show you roughly what we're going to be doing next week and quickly show you how you can export. So I'm going to switch back to Lightroom. And up here in the top, you remember we were in library view and we're now going to develop mode. This is the place where we can do all the editing. And watch how it all changes once you click on it. Both the left and the right side completely change. And on the right is where all the music is. Now, if this looks a bit different on your computer at the moment, Wait until next week. I'll show you how to set it up that all of your edits that are important are going to be in one view. So let me just edit maybe um, this one. And you'll see how quickly I can color correct and fine tune this picture. So I'm just going to um, white balance it a little bit. Maybe do a bit more red. Highlights are a bit sharp here. I'm going to make it a bit shorter with clarity, a bit more saturation. Make the blues a bit more pop. Orange and yellow is good. And now you can see that on the left, this is all a bit bright. So what you see me doing now is essentially what we're going to learn in the third section. This is partial editing. 
So reduce the brightness here and here. I'm gonna make this reflection a bit sharper. Don't worry guys, I am just trying to show you what's all possible. We're gonna go through all of these step by step next week. Okay, make sure this is nice and blue. All right, and now one thing here at the bottom, there's a shadow of my strobe or camera housing probably. Let me just show you how quickly I can get rid of that. Brightness, take darks out, make it yellow. This is very rough, but essentially, if you're counting the time, you can see that we're essentially in a couple of minutes fine tuning this picture to be very nice. Maybe do maybe one more of these. Okay. It's not perfect, guys, but just to show you what you can do in literally less than a minute to a photo. This is what it looks like now, and this is, oops, this is what it was before. Big difference, I think, and very useful to be able to do that all in one program. Then you go to export. How do you get there? Right click on anywhere on the image. Yeah, so with your right mouse click, you click on the image, or down here on the thumbnail, you can also click, and you go to export. Export is where you make the JPEG, okay? So in your export, that's essentially where you decide what you're gonna do to your picture. And you'll see quite a lot of settings here. They are all in, um, they're all in that handout, but essentially you decide on a folder where this goes. And I suggest that you make a specific folder in the folder of your photos. Let me just show you what that looks like. So in your photos, you can see here now, there's test trip. And now here are the four days, right? But I'm gonna add a folder that's called A selection. The reason I call it A is so that it will be automatically at the top if you sort it alphabetically. And this is where all of my JPEGs are gonna be. Then I'm gonna do a custom name plus the original file number. That is useful so you can find the photo back. So if somebody says, oh, I really like that photo that you took in Raja Ampat, which is called Raja Ampat 2020 Simon Lorenz and then the number, like you can see here, that is how I've set it up. <clears throat> the reason I'm gonna put location here first, that's if you put all of your photos in your portfolio, then the location will be sorted together. So you will have all of your Raja Ampat photos together. It doesn't matter if you took them in 2018, 2019, or 2020, okay? Then there's a couple of things that you can do. We'll go through those next time and the time after that. But here's a general way that you can reduce the file size to only five megabytes. That makes it nice and easy to share via email or WhatsApp. Um, or also put it on Facebook. You can also resize it to five megapixels. Do your resolution to 150. If you only wanna use it for Facebook and Instagram, you can use 72. But I personally find if you use 150, you can use it across everything. And in 99% of the cases, all I do is export 150 uh, megapixels, sorry, 100 pix 150 DPI, so pixel per inch. And um, uh, you can use this setting as well. Don't do any output sharpening, don't add any metadata, don't do any post-processing. The only thing is the watermark. I'll teach you guys how to use a watermark later, but you can see I've got lots of different watermarks. You can um, tick or untick those. And now when you export, what you see in the top left is it's being exported. You can actually now keep working on other things. And while you're working on other things, the export is happening in the meantime, um, in, your computer is doing that. All right. So once that is done, at some point you will see this bar is going to be finished. Taking a bit of time now, I'm not quite sure why it's taking so long, but once it's done, it will actually appear in here. And now you can see in my folder selection, if I sort it by name, right, you will see I've got a selection as the first folder, and here is where all my raw files are. Yeah. So in a selection will be all my JPEGs. You can see here, this is my JPEG that we just made. It is now 3.4 megabytes. You can see that down here. 
Yeah, so it's now 3.4 megabytes, still a very good resolution, and that is perfect for sharing on any form. I've even sent this format to magazines and they've printed it no problem. And it's only three megabytes, so that's why I export this. The other thing that you can see here is every picture that I've touched with a rating or an edit has an XMP file. And they're actually, because I haven't done any edits yet, only three kilobytes, tiny. You see all of the ones that I've touched have got some XMP file. Okay, so that was it in terms of what I want to do today. I already told you um, what you could do for next time. Um, I wanted to open the floor to questions, but I do have to mention that we've only got five minutes left. I have more time. If you guys want to stay in and do questions, um, that's great. Um, I would get almost a full picture here. I'm going to take a selfie and share it with everybody. All right. So we can try to do something. Everybody do like an okay sign maybe? Should we do an okay sign? We can't go diving, but we can do an okay sign. Smile, everybody's in there. Fabulous. Well, thanks guys, it was good fun. So um, next week, same time. I think a lot of you registered already. If you think it's useful for some of your friends, I feel this session is a good start, but I'm gonna give you a handout you can forward to your friends if anybody else wants to join. I can get up to 100 people in the room. So we still have space if you want to invite anybody else. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'll send you an email tomorrow with uh, also a questionnaire. If you have any feedback, please. It's the first time I've done it. So I'd love the feedback.